Well, hello, welcome to another episode of Jim's Like My Garden. Okay, so I'm just going to pick a few beetroots, and all I all I typically do is you can you can dig them out, but I find if you just waggle them to and fro like that, they'll actually pull out. Now that's not a particularly big one, um, but they do vary in size. So I typically don't don't grab the actual leaves, grab the actual beetroot itself, like that, and just pull it out. So what I'll be doing as soon as I've pulled these out um, is I'll be replacing them um, in the spaces where they come from. I've got some more. Uh, beetroot here. Um, what I'll be doing is putting those little plugs in where I've taken the other ones out so they can come a little bit later on. So as I say all you need to do is go in, hold the beetroot at the side like that and then backwards and forward and you'll find that the beetroot will come out. Um, now with <laughs> with beetroot what you can do is uh, you know they will keep on growing right up to the end of the season so there's no reason why you can't think you can uh, you know you can put another um, you know batch in so I'm just going to get this last one here that's it um, and if you keep the ground reasonably well weeded and sort of loose you know they will come straight out if you're a little bit harder to come out what you can do is um, um, you know just loosen them up with a shovel or a, sorry a spade or a fork underneath them um, what I would suggest you do is if um, if you're um, if you're not going to eat them straight away, I'd cut the leaves off at about there to stop the evaporation. Um, but um, if you're going to eat them reasonably quickly, then uh, leave the leaves on, and then they'll uh, keep fresh for a little bit longer. Okay, so I just want to give you a quick update on the. Um on the uh, birdhouse gourds. Now if you remember obviously these are planted down at the bottom, they need a bit of water and they're a little bit dry but these were kind of here last week and they've gone from there all the way up to there. Um, I explained they were going to send these tendrils out and there you go you know they're already starting to attach themselves now. What I need to do is wait for that to grow a little bit further um, so another foot or so and then I'll, I'll sort of bend it over and start to train it going that way. Likewise with this one um, I tied this at the bottom there, if you remember, and that was about here at the time, so that's grown all the way up to here. And as you can see, these tendrils, these will wrap themselves around um, the bar. Um, just a quick note, this one's this one stayed on the outside of it, so that's okay. But this one here has actually gone behind the, the mesh. Um, so what I need to do is, just to make sure that that's not snagging, what I might need to do is put something behind the, the wire here so it's got plenty of room to grow as it gets wider. As you can see it's already made a, a witness mark on the, the stem there, I don't know if you can see that. But in there there's like a, like a, like a little brown spot. Um, that's where it's rubbing against here. So what I need to do is just um, put a bit of something in there to stop it from rubbing. But as you can see I've got flowers forming here. There's also other side shoots here. There's a flower forming there. Um, that one's stuck behind the tendril so just help that one out a little bit but there's another one so they are growing really well so what I'll do is I'll get another couple of pieces of this mesh and um, basically train it that way along um, so it's got some support likewise on here what I can do is um, I have actually got a series of nails on here anyway which is where I hang the onions up so what I could potentially do is tie that to this or just let it trail along the top of the fence but um, what, I'll, what I'll probably do is get some more mesh um, there's a bit here as you can see, and then just pour it along like that for that to for that to go wrong. So that's the birdhouse gourds, that's what they look at the moment, so they are doing really well. They're also throwing out these sort of little side shoots here and here, um, so they are doing really well at the moment. 
Okay, in one week on you can see so much difference. All of these side shoots have um, grown out. And then the main shoot that you saw just that was about up to here has grown all the way along there. So it's basically grown about uh, two or three foot this week. Um, this one's just the same on here. Um, as you can see, all of the side shoots coming out. Um, and on each of these, you know, we're starting to get flower buds forming. You can see um, flower buds all over it now. So I need to kind of untangle that from the uh, the mesh at the back there and just run it along, run it along here so it carries along the fence. But that's what the bird has goes to look like now. Okay, so that's what that's what ruby and uh, rhubarb look like now. Um, as you can see, they're growing really quickly. And uh, even though I only filled the food um, tub about five minutes ago, they've managed to kick it everywhere. And they've become expert paper shredders. They uh, they tend to go through the paper like a like a dose of salt. So these will also be cleaned out at some point um, this afternoon. So um, and the water, what they tend to do with the water, this was this was also clean at about two hours ago. Um, they um, they chuck all the paper in there and get all the uh, the water muddy, so they are uh, they are messy little beggars. But they will be most certainly big enough in the next few weeks to to go in with the rest of the chickens. And um, as you can see, they are getting their full feathers now, so they are doing really well. Um, I've just put the light on quickly now, um, so you can actually see them. But um, today, what I've got is the door open and the um, and the light off because it is quite warm today. So um, what you need to do is keep them warm, but don't let them get too hot. Um, but that's what ruby and rhubarb look like today. Okay, so I was asked to do a quick update on the um, on my um, existing chickens. Obviously, I've shown you ruby and rhubarb, the uh, the two chicks. Um, so they're coming on now. I'm, I'm just about to um, to clean out the uh, the chickens this week. So um, as you can see, they do love um, kicking the dirt about, and you can see on the bottom there they've got straw and stuff. But they do they do tend to. Um, sort of dig into the ground. I don't know if you look over here, but they, what, they, what they do um, this time of year is they um, they dig holes in the ground basically. So they dig the straw out of the way and then they kick the uh, the dirt around. Now this is this is a natural behaviour for them to do because basically what they do is they, they have like a, like a dust bath if you like and that helps to keep their um, skin, uh, the, the, the feathers and the skin healthy and that. So um, it's always um, it's always important when in a in a chicken run, what you should have is a, a roosting bar like this, which is a piece of wood about sort of two inches across. Now they'll all sleep on, uh, sort of sleep on it, so they'll come up here and perch. So it's basically like a branch in the tree. Um, so even though they are clustered as um, flightless birds, chickens will flutter up up to 20 feet or so to roost in a tree. So you always need to have somewhere for them to um, somewhere for them to sort of um, sort of grab hold of. Now you need something about two inches across. Something like this is ideal. Um, and it's a reasonable piece of wood, obviously, because I've, you know, I have had quite a few chickens sort of sat on there. Um, the only problem is, is this time of year with them kicking the kicking the dirt about, they do get it in the water, as you can see. Now that was clean a couple of days ago, and basically they just kick dirt in there and it gets all mucky. So every couple of days I have to give it a good scrub out, and then put some fresh um, water and that in. But um, they're doing really well. But unfortunately, um, because my chickens were getting quite old, um, as you know if you've seen my early videos. Um, I was planning to get some more chickens last year but never got around to it so I have only actually got now um, four hens so these two here which are um, copper morans um, and then this one here which is a standard brown um, chicken and that's a cream leg bar there and unfortunately this cream leg bar here has got to the age now where she's not laying anymore and of course we've got Douglas the cockerel uh, which I'm not sure of his breed but uh, basically a noisy one but uh, that's the that's the sort of the grown-up chickens that I've got. Now I have down-numbered um, with the chickens. I do in in the past I've actually had about 20, I think 23 or 24 is the maximum I've got to. Um, but um, I've got two new ones this year, um, so I'm only going to have about sort of six hens. Uh, but chickens typically um, typically live till they're about five or six. Um, I actually lost one earlier this year, and she was um, she was um, nine years old. Which is my um, actually my record. She was a um, she was a um, bluebell, the uh, the breed's called. So it's a it's a, it's a sort of grey one like this cream leg bar here, but slightly bigger build. So more like the um, more like the uh, the Morans, but but sort of like a grey. So it looks like a big pigeon basically. But um, that's what the uh, the chickens look like. But I have lost um, I think I've lost five this year, just basically through old age, unfortunately. Um, but that's um, 
that's what that's how it goes with chickens when they do get to sort of four or five um, they do tend to give up and you know they just basically keel over and there's really nothing you can do um, for them really but uh, anyway that's what the, uh, the chickens look like at the moment so I'm just about to let them out onto the lawn so they can have a run about and uh, they'll be sunbathing for the rest of the afternoon. So I just thought to do a few of the comments and questions that have come over in the past few days. Uh, the first one comes from Slasher and he was asking me about some sunflowers that he's been growing and uh, they're about con six foot high so they're a little bit better than mine um, and um, he was saying that one of the uh, the flower heads has um, rotted off. Now it's it's unlikely to be any sort of pollination type um, problems obviously because the flowers have not opened yet so what I would imagine it is is um, if you've had a reasonable amount of rain what can happen is when the flower head forms at the top the water can actually sit actually inside the bud and um, that's possibly what's caused the problem obviously without seeing it I'm not quite sure um, but um, I, I would imagine with with a lot of sunflowers they actually put the flower out to the side like that and then slightly facing down and as it opens it tends to open up sideways and move up slightly to face the sun um, but on occasion some of them actually have the bud facing upwards and these are the ones that obviously can collect water and the water sits in the bud which will then obviously have the you, you know basically rot it so that's quite possibly what's happened with that uh, the next one comes from uh, Richard Sydenham and he was saying um, he's come up with a solution for the onions now um, as you know I explained in an episode or two um, ago um, that uh, my onions have got this um, this, this fungus, this, um, this, uh, this sort of misty um, fungus on them which unfortunately there isn't any um, known solution um, to, you, you know, to sort of help them. But what Rich has come up with, he said if you get mare's tail and make a tea out of that then what that will actually do is um, if you water your onions with it it'll actually protect the onions. Now there is actually some mare's tail down the bottom end of the uh, the field and what I might do is go and harvest some of that and, and give it a go. I know the fungus is already on there and I think this is more of a prevention rather than a cure but um, I'll, I'll give it a go and see what um, see what happens but thank you very much for your tip. So obviously an organic way of doing it. So what you'd need to do is basically get the mare's tail, shred it all up with a knife, so get a knife and chop it up or put it in a liquidizer, liquidize it up and then um, put it into a, um, a bowl or a jug or something like that, pour some boiling water onto it and then that will get the, the oils and that out of the, uh, the mare's tail. Um, <clears throat> and then after it's gone cool you can then sift it, put it in your spray can and then spray it onto the, um, uh, the onions. Now the thing is with mare's tail and what I, what I understand is that it's quite a waxy plant. It is actually a weed and it's, it's difficult to kill off because basically weed killers don't stick to it. So it's very much like ivy and you know other plants like that. They've got a waxy sort of coat to them. So if you try and spray them on anything, it doesn't stick on there and uh, and, and um, obviously it doesn't you know sort of kill them off. So they are difficult to get rid of, and also the roots go go quite deep. So um, I'd imagine what what you're doing is you're extracting that waxy um, finish on the leaves, and then that's going into the um, that's going into the solution. And when you obviously spray that onto the onions, it's then putting that property onto the onions as well. So the the fungus can't get a latch onto the um, onto the uh, onions, and also if it does rain, the rain will wash off it as opposed to keeping them wet, which is obviously the the environment that the the fungus will actually grow in and thrive in. So really good tip, thank you for that, Richard. Next one comes from um, Fifty Shades of Green, and they were saying about sort of hand pollinating. Now. I don't do a lot of that myself to be honest with you because um, I've got a lot of insects around me, there's always flies, bees and all sorts of stuff flying around as you've probably seen clips of me before showing the um, the eggplant down the bottom end and the calendulas and the sunflowers and the and uh, particularly the comfrey, the bees just love that as, as one just flies by me. Um, so I've always got plenty of insects around me to pollinate things but if you don't have that luxury, um, um, pollinating things by hand um, is obviously another method of doing it and what I would suggest you do is get a small brush and then just just roll the brush around inside the the, the male flower and then put that into the uh, the female flower then what you'll do is you'll cross um, the pollen from the male into the female and then obviously pollinate the uh, the flower that's, that's that's one easy way of doing it I wouldn't suggest you do it with your fingers because it will tend to stick on your fingers so what you want is a small soft brush put that into the male flower and then put it into the um, um, the female flower, and basically you emulate, you, you, you know, what a bee or a, or a wasp or, or a fly, or, you, you know, whatever would do. So yes, you, yes, you can do that. If you are um, wanting to get a certain type of plant, so you're breeding plants, obviously that's a, you know, you keep the insects out, and basically what you do is you can then 
control where the pollen goes to which flower so you can cross two different varieties over so that's obviously one way of doing it but if you're just after the fruit like most of us then most certainly uh, the way to do it if you haven't got insects is to um, do it with a little brush or, or more traditionally you do it with a rabbit's tail but um, rabbit's tails aren't easy uh, <laughs> to, to get hold of so what I would suggest is a little brush you can actually buy these brushes from um, gardening centres um, I've seen them for sale but um, but yeah uh, you know all all of the plants that I've got here basically insects do the job for me which is which is the you know by far the best way of doing it um, the next one comes from um, Milos Coffee talking about airflow and um, basically they were saying that uh, they've got a tunnel and what they've done is they've put some um, slits at the, the, the far end of the tunnel. They've got a, um, a fungal problem, they've got some sort of brown, brown chocolate coloured spots forming on the leaves of the, uh, the tomato plants. And what they've done now is, is removed the, the, the infected leaves and they've put some slits across the back and down the side of this polytunnel. And the whole situation is getting much better and that's the, that's the way to control it basically. So, um, you know, airflow, obviously, you know, I'm putting out a few videos at the moment about sort of putting more windows in your greenhouse and that. And at this time of year, um, it is, um, you know, a, a really good thing to do because you, because with, with the heat, I mean, in, in here it's actually, it's 33 degrees centigrade at the moment. And uh, in Fahrenheit, it's, that's 91. And uh, obviously, if you're watering the plants, um, that's just, a lot of that's going to turn to humidity and then you'll get condensation on the windows and on the plants. And that's a really good environment for fungus and stuff like that to um, you know to form on the plants and then obviously they'll they'll take hold of the plants and then away you go you've lost your plant so uh, getting ventilation into to minimize the humidity in a greenhouse or a tunnel or, or wherever close you know a close space is most certainly um, the best way of combating any type of fungal problem likewise with potatoes um, and onions um, always try to minimize overcrowding so if you have got plenty of space with your potatoes you know always try to um, plant them as far apart as you can the, the Royal Horticultural Society always recommend to plant them you know at least sort of 36 inches or um, 3 feet 90, 90 centimeters apart um, you know between the rows and that's more than anything that's to get airflow up and down so you don't have any sort of blight problems on your, on your um, potatoes Obviously, if you do get weeds within your potatoes, take them weeds out because that, that's something else that's going to stop the airflow and is going to stop the, um, you know, the, the, uh, um, you know, the moisture building up on the plants and therefore the fungus has the right environment. So, um, and it's, it, it, that's, that's always why in July, which is this month, we always get problems with blight and things like that because what you get is this nice hot weather um, in the UK and then we get the odd shower here and there. So what happens is nice warm weather and then you get a sudden downpour of rain which lasts for half an hour or so um, and then um, all of that moisture then turns into vapour and obviously goes on the plants and then that's where you get the warmth and the humidity and that's where funguses can form and grow so uh, if you can minimise that so either keep it dry or cool or, or whatever then the funguses don't have the the right um, environment to thrive so therefore you won't get them so or, or you minimise them at least so um, always make sure you've got plenty of airflow um, there was another comment that came over from um, Nigel Muddy Boots over in Wolverhampton and he was saying that he actually takes some of the panes of glass out of his greenhouse at this time of year just to you know just to you know increase the uh, the airflow through so obviously if you don't have any opening windows like the, like the one I've just put in um, you can just take one of the panes of glass out um, leave it out for a couple of months and then when we get you know sort of into September then you can put the pane of glass back in so that's obviously another cheaper way of doing it. Um, next one comes from um, um, Spate Water and also Dean Spencer and uh, I don't know if you noticed last week but whilst I was doing the comments um, my daughter and Dorothy were <laughs> coming over the top of the uh, the, um, uh, the gate behind me I didn't put any comment in I just thought to see who would, who would sort of notice but uh, this is Dorothy come here if you haven't seen her before she's uh, she's my little shadow she's always with me up the garden and um, she's, a, she's a really good companion for me so she's always here on the floor, you, you you can't always see, but she's always up the garden at some at, at um, somewhere or another. So she um, she uh, you know she comes up the lumber with me quite often and uh, is a, is a good companion for me. Uh, the next one comes from uh, Malcolm Brown, and uh, he was saying that he's got um, some tomatoes, really nice plants, but he says the tomatoes get quite high before he gets any flowers and fruit on it. Now um, this is this is going to be caused by one of two things. Um, and it's likely to be the second one. The first one is lack of light. 
so basically the plants are growing really um, as fast as they can to get up to get to light so that's one possibility unlikely because I don't have too much light in here because um, my tomatoes are a little bit overcrowded to be honest with you I've, I've put a, um, quite a few in and I think they are a bit overcrowded this year um, the second problem that you will get is the is the um, the soil and as I've always said you know the soil the the, uh, the makeup of the soil um, will most certainly um, if you can get the soil right then the uh, the rest of it will come true for you so in the soil you've got three things uh, the first one is nitrogen well, well three main things anyway the first one is nitrogen nitrogen is um, needed for um, the development of the leaves and the shoots of a plant the next one is um, phosphorus now phosphorus is used for um, the forming of the, of the roots of the plants and also um, partially to do with the flowers as well so um, it's possible you've got low phosphorus in the soil. The next one, which is more likely than not, is um, potash or potassium. Um, now that potassium is needed by the plants to form the flowers and the fruits. So if you're not getting flowers till you get quite high up, the likelihood is that you need to put more potash and uh, more phosphorus into the soil. So what I would suggest you do is get a really good, um, a really good um, tomato fertilizer. Um, there are quite a few out on the market that you can get and give them a really good dose you know, and what that will do is encourage the plant to produce flowers and fruit. You can make your own and I make my own as you saw me the other day, all you need to do is grow comfrey in exactly the same way as I do, chop it all up, put it into a dustbin and then the juice off that, um, put that 10 to 1 into a water, watering can and then water the tomatoes with it. Um, if you've got one truss of flowers on the uh, on the plant then give it once a week if there's two trusses give it twice a week three trusses three times a week and so on um, but if you've not got any trusses on on your plants at all what i would suggest you do is give them a really good dose of um, um, sort of um, potassium and also phosphorus rich um, fertilizer and that will most certainly encourage the plants to perform the flowers etc or the or the or the fruiting trusses um, that's the best bit of advice I can give you it could possibly be the light without seeing the plants I'm not quite sure if it is the light the the plants will be um, quite thin and spindly and they'll be tall and not particularly wide so basically they're trying to they're sending all their energy to grow upwards to try and find the light that's one possibility but if the if the shoots are nice and thick now the the, the, the stems on my tomato plant here are, are quite thick, they're probably about um, an inch or so across now. So if they're nice and thick but they've not got any fruiting trusses on them, it's likely to be the fertiliser in the ground. So um, basically what you need is phosphorus and potash in the ground or potassium in the ground and then that will give them a boost into um, into um, sort of growing it. So, but always follow the instructions on the label or um, if you're making your comfrey, always water it down 10 to 1 because you can burn the roots if you're not careful. So don't put too much in. What you need to do is, is it's, it's much better to feed them um, little and often rather than give them you know, loads in one go. So um, yeah, that's the best bit of advice I can give you. Next, next comment comes from Victoria Holstrom again. Holstrom again sorry. Victoria Holstrom. Um, and we were talking about the raspberries and um, she's got some beetle. Um, I have researched it slightly more. There are a few weevils, um, like little beetles, that will eat into the leaves. Um, that's, that's possibly the cause. Um, but, but the comment that I wanted to quickly say is I, I mentioned about spraying them with garlic. What you can also do is a lot of these beetles and insects and that actually live in the ground around the plant. So if you get, um, make yourself up a nice batch of garlic um, in some water so crush the garlic up as much as you can put some boiling water on there let it cool down and then water the plant with that as well and what that will do is it, it won't do any harm to the plant at all but what it will do is it'll put the garlic um, oil into the ground and then if these um, little beetles or weevils are in the ground it'll kill them in the ground as well because the likely to be if you can't see them on the plant the likelihood is they're in the ground waiting to come back out again so if you do that it'll it'll kill them off in the ground as well um, sorry, two more comments. The first one comes from Trudy, uh, Trudy Williams saying, am I too late to plant pumpkins and um, squashes? Um, to be honest with you, um, you are a little bit late, but having said that, a few years ago I did plant some pumpkins at this time of the year because unfortunately mine damped off and I thought, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. I've got some seed and I thought I'd, I'd um, grow them um, from now on. 
So I actually planted them now. What I would suggest you do is if you haven't got them already and you can't buy any already established planting garden centres, that's the best thing to do now. Buy established plants. That you know there, there are garden centres out there which will still have pumpkin and courgette plants and squash plants ready to plant in the ground. That's the best way to do it. If you're planting from seed, it's going to take you a couple of weeks to germinate them and, and, and sort of grow them on. So by the time you've got them in the ground, you're most certainly going to be at the end of July, possibly into August, and then you've only really got sort of six or seven weeks of growing season left. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to get much of a um, crop off that. So if you can find um, established plants, then do that. If not, put some seeds in. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, I think. I have planted them at this time of year, and I have got pumpkins. They're not typically big, but I have got pumpkins from the plants. Um, so, yes, it, you can still do it now. Um, and the next last one comes from um, um, Lorraine Robbins, and um, asking about the... Um, greenhouse door. Now obviously if you've noticed the greenhouse door is open, it is always open. If you ever see, at this time of year anyway it's always open. Um, if you ever see the greenhouse door shut whilst I'm talking to the camera, the reason being is somebody's got a strimmer going or they've got something, you know, something noisy happening. So what I'll do is I'll just shut the door so that you can hear me as opposed to a strimmer or a lawnmower or something going on. So if you do, I, I always keep the, uh, the greenhouse door open at this time of year. If it's ever shut, um, the only reason I've shut it is so the noise is, is um, reduced inside the greenhouse so you can hear my voice. Quick update on the, uh, the sweet peas. You can see they're really um, blooming now, these two patches. What I do need to do is tie some of these in that have got a little bit um, sort of hanging out at the top so they're not quite holding on. So I need to put a little bit of string in there just to hold them back. But uh, the, the point I wanted to quickly make is when the flowers are finished, um, if you look a bit further down here, say this one for example there, what you need to do as soon as it's, sorry that's not a flower, this one here, hang on, where's a flower that's finished? Uh, Anyway, when the flowers are finished, what you want to do is pull the pull the flower head off altogether. Otherwise, what will happen is it'll it'll um, um, form into the the seed pod, and then the the plant will actually stop flowering, or will most certainly reduce flowering. So as soon as you see the flowers go over, um, what you need to do is um, take off the uh, the flower stalk, so it, so the plant doesn't put its energy into making the seed. Okay, so I've not been up very much to the, to the greenhouse this um, this week with one thing and another. I've been quite busy, but uh, the amount that uh, the, the tomatoes have grown are absolutely incredible. But the comment I wanted to say was this stuff, which is the uh, comes in reels like that, and um, it's like double sided um, Velcro. And all you need to do is cut yourself off a strip about that long. Um, now this this is this is ideal for it's the first time I've used used it this year. I have seen it on other plants before. Um, this is the first time I've used it on the tomatoes, most certainly. And what you just do is uh, just below, just below a fruiting truss. Uh, what you can do is uh, just um, basically support the plant on, onto the uh, onto the, uh, the bamboo stick like that. And then what that will do is it'll it'll hold the plant nice and steady. So as the fruit starts to form, and the weight. Um, of the fruit tries to pull it down, you know, it's it's sort of adequately um, sort of supported. Now, obviously the other thing you can do is use string, um, but the problem is that you have with string is what it can do is cut into the uh, the stem of the plant if you're not careful. But if you are using string, what's important is tie it really tight to the, the stick first and then go round the, round the plant twice and then just tie it loosely round the plant so you're not sort of strangulating the strangling um, the, um, the, uh, the tomato. I think I've made another word up there. Um, but basically what you want to do is um, you know sort of support the plant but the always remember that the that the stem obviously the stem of this one now is probably about um, probably about 10, milli uh, 10 millimeters one centimeter wide but as time goes on in the next couple of weeks that's going to expand to probably the size of my thumb. So uh, you know what you don't want to do is tie it on there too thickly because as the as the uh, as as the stem increases in diameter, the 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 um, the string will most certainly start to cut into the stem and cause you a problem. The good thing with um, the Velcro is it's wide, so there's not any part that's going to cut into it. But what you can do is if 
it, if, if you notice one gets a bit tight, what you can do is just quickly undo it like that, give it a bit more space and then uh, put it back in, put it in a bit looser than it was before and then uh, you know you can you know give the plant a bit of extra you know sort of um, length in it to you know sort of grow a bit further so that's what I'm doing with the tomatoes at the moment and uh, I've got quite a few to go through now the tomatoes have grown absolutely um, absolutely incredibly over the last week they must have grown over a foot and now these as you can see are almost at the top and what I'm going to do is as, what, I, what I normally do as soon as you get to the top here when I've got four or five fruit trusses as you can see there's one there which is basically flowers right now there's one down here, I don't know if you can see, it's, it's just off camera, I'll just adjust the camera down. There's one there which is just starting to form um, fruits. And then there's one down here which has actually got fruits on, which is most certainly off the camera. So this has actually got three fruit trusses on, and then there's one more coming there, so that's the fourth. I normally get four or five. Um, in fact, there's the fifth one there, there's a, the, the fifth one's there as well. So I normally get five and then take the top out of the plant to... Um, and then stop it. So what I mean by stopping it is the, the growing tip, so that's that's basically the growing tip there. All you do is you just take that bit out altogether and then the plant will stop. Um, so it, at that point it'll put all of its energy into the fruit. Now if you want if you want lots of tomatoes but not so big, you can let it have four or five or six, seven, eight trusses on the plant. And what you can do is grow it up. Then there's nothing stopping you growing it even further up the roof. Uh, which is what other people do, um, that I know. Um, they'll, you know, they'll let their tomato plants have, you know, five, six, seven trusses on. Um, now, if you're feeding the plants heavily and watering them on a regular basis, there's no reason why these tomatoes won't get nice and big as well. But um, realistically, depending on how many fruits you've got on each of the trusses. Now, some of these trusses here, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's about twenty tomatoes on each of the trusses. So that's basically, um, there's, so there's going to be almost 100 tomatoes on this one plant. Um, obviously if you get more trusses, every trusses you get, you've got a potential another 10 or 20 tomatoes. So there's only so many fruits a, a given plant will support. But um, if you have got less fruit down um, on, on the lower trusses, what you can do, is, uh, the point I was making is, you know, you can grow it on and get more trusses if you like. But uh, I wouldn't do too much because what you can end up with is lots of small tomatoes which are difficult to ripen because they, they, they form too late in the season. So really what you want now is the tomatoes to be um, sort of an inch or so across at the bottom, which a lot of these are. I'll, I'll take the camera out and show you in a minute. But um, also as well, I've, I've taken quite a lot of leaves out from the bottom of the plants. What I might start to do now is also take some of the, um, the leaves further up just to get more light onto the, uh, the plants and the fruits. Um, so the, uh, they form a little bit better than they are at the moment. So I hope this episode has been of some interest to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's on the Garden.